So our next panel is going to be about social media, and um, we've basically got the best people in town on this topic, so I'm really excited to talk to them. Um, first, I want to bring out Ronnie Cho, who's a vice president and head of public affairs at MTV. Ronnie, big round of applause for Ronnie. guys. <laughs> Next is Corey Schulman, who's a Deputy Director of Digital Strategy for the White House. And last but not least, John Tass Parker, who's uh, the Head of Politics and Government Outreach at Instagram. And we can give John a little extra applause because Instagram announced today that they have 500 million users around the world. So, congrats, John. So, I wanted to start off, um, Ronnie, maybe with you. How did you get into this line of work? Um, obviously, it's a space that's developing. How have you seen it change, and what's your favorite part about it? You know, uh, candidly, I've, I've been actually at MTV for about a year and a half working on uh, using MTV's platform, its brand, for um, social justice causes. Um, I had worked with the White House with Corey for a number of years, um, doing youth engagement on behalf of the president. And, um, you know, when I came to MTV, a lot of folks were like, how do you go to, from the White House to MTV? It should be a pretty tough transition. But I have to say, it was pretty easy. I mean, we're working on many of the, uh, the same issues, talking about um, you know, LGBT rights, talking about climate change, um, talking about racial inequality, and a lot of the issues that young people care about from my old job, um, uh, it was easily transferable to the role that I have now at MTV and, and using our superpowers for, for good when it comes to talking about um, white privilege, talking about intersectional feminism, talking about any number of issues that I think lie at the heart of of what many millennials face day to day, and uh, and and want to sort of challenge and get to know more of. So, it's uh, it's been a, a real honor to have been a part of two really great organizations in two very different ways, but doing similar work. Yeah, Corey, what about you? You were with Obama from the beginning of the campaign, right? Yeah. yeah so I started actually as a volunteer on President Obama's first campaign in 2008 in Chicago. I grew up in Chicago and, uh, you know, it just seemed like an interesting opportunity, a short-term sprint that I would do before I was going to figure out what I would actually do, uh, which is so many people's stories now that are currently at the White House. Um, and, uh, you know, after he won, uh, even then I didn't think that I would necessarily go to the White House, um, but I had the opportunity in 2009 to join what was then called the New Media Team. We're now called digital. New Media is uh, a bit dated. Um, and uh, I've been on that team ever since, so going into the eighth year. Um, and it's been amazing because uh, not only has the digital landscape changed so much, the work that we do inside the building on behalf of the president has evolved so greatly. And this work has never been more important to uh, connect with citizens around the country on the issues that they care about. So uh, even uh, all these years in, there's never been a slow day. Yeah. John, what about you? Yeah. Um, so it's a pretty big day for Instagram, obviously. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I'd say is that there's over uh, I think it's around 95 million images or videos that are uploaded on any one day to Instagram. Um, and why I think that's important is that like, it just shows such an incredibly overwhelming amount of creativity that is happening around the world at any one time. And so, you know, the work that I do is kind of how do you, how do you, how do you work with government entities, political campaigns, uh, politicians, activists to, you know, kind of, synthesize that and work out, okay, well, look, there's all this creative energy out there and how do you communicate amongst it and in that same language, which is really challenging, but also really rewarding as well uh, when, you are, when, you are trying to, um, when you are trying to cut through that, uh, you know, a lot of noise out there. So I was always attracted to that creativity and um, my background's in Australian politics before I came over here about two and a half years ago to join the team. And do you feel like that kind of transformation can apply to politics as well through the lens of Instagram? Absolutely. Uh, you look at the work that, you know, that Corey and, and her, her colleagues have done at the White House, it's very clear that uh, there is, a, there is a, a visual language that is emerging 
right now. Uh, in 2015, there were more photographs that were captured on camera phones uh, that were, than were captured in the entire analog era. Uh, and so that, that means something, right? <laughs> it means that there is some kind, some, there's some consequence to all that content production and it's changed the way that we kind of communicate with each other, especially uh, in this uh, millennial kind of demographic. And unfortunately, our research team informed me that I'm a maturing millennial now, um, which kind of sounds a bit morbid, right? <laughs> so I want to ask Ronnie and Corey about your favorite White House social media moment and the kind of approach that the White House takes. I know I'm asking you as an alum, but the kind of approach the White House takes to social media. Obviously, there's never been an administration like this one uh, connecting and intersecting with the digital era, so. Favorite Instagram moment? I, I have to say, I think it was after the, um, the ruling on marriage equality, just about almost exactly a year ago, and there was that amazing photo of the White House lit up in, in rainbow colors, and I think uh, you'd have to have been under a rock to have not seen that or um, be moved by it. And so that, I think for me, uh, again, using the visual language of, of what the building stood for and stands for and the colors, what it stands for and the medium in which it was being delivered, I think was a really interesting moment of sort of the intersection of where we are in media and politics and culture and, and social justice all kind of wrapped up in, in a single moment. And I think one of the, the big strategies the president has always been really exceptional at is, is connecting with people where they are. Um, and that was clear on the campaign. It was certainly clear in our work engaging young people from the, from the White House is, is to, to go where they are and to, to make it easy for engagement to occur, uh, particularly around um, with young people. And, uh, and I have to say, I think Corey is one of the most talented people you'll ever meet on, on digital strategy. Uh, she if you interacted with the, the White House at all at any point on Snapchat, Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook, you name it. Um, a lot of that had come from Corey's massive brain. And uh, I've got a, there's a big team too. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, it's a, they employ a lot of really smart tactics to, to get to, to people. And I think it's something everyone can learn from. Yeah. Corey, what about you? Um, thank you, Ronnie. Uh, I, I hope my team is watching or I'll be sure to relay the, the comments. <laughs> Um, my favorite social media moment with the president is really, um, I think, hard to pick just one. But if I had to, um, he joined Twitter uh, as at POTUS relatively late, um, uh, you know, over the course of two terms. Um, but that was the first dedicated social channel uh, from the White House for his voice. Um, and what I would say is the reason why that is particularly important and meaningful to me is that it created this new venue, this new channel for the president to go right to the American people um, on issues and topics that uh, you know he might not deliver a speech on, there might not be a written statement or an op-ed, um, enabling him to talk about culturally, culturally relevant things like the Cavs win uh, over the weekend. Um, <laughs> any any, any uh, fans out there? Uh, and, but uh, also, um, to Ronnie's point, uh, he sent a tweet out about the Supreme Court decision on gay marriage uh, immediately after it happened. He sent a tweet um, uh, commenting on uh, Ahmed, the young innovator who uh, built a clock and uh, supporting him and offering him an invitation to the White House. And so um, uh, it's not just uh, a new venue for him to talk directly to people, it creates two-way conversations as well. And so we've done a number of Q and A's. Um, uh, it really is uh, a new platform in place for him to offer his voice, and that's just expanded. Uh, uh, he has channels on Facebook, um, but what I would say is generally, and Ronnie spoke about this a bit, is our approach is very much to meet people where they are, uh, look for different online communities and channels where there are audiences that we want to talk to on a range of issues. Um, and that is our driving approach, which is we don't anticipate uh, people are going to whitehouse.gov every day or that they're necessarily following us on Twitter or Instagram or Snapchat. Um, but we like to look for different types of communities where we can talk to people about the issues that they care about. And that's really been our driving principle from day one. And that's kind of how we've continued to grow our presences and kind of think strategically about our approach because 
there's no shortage of platforms and places we could be, uh, and so we have to be strategic about that approach. Yeah. John, I want to ask you where you think Washington, D.C. and the political world generally succeed when it comes to Instagram, and where could they improve? Uh, and this kind of goes off on, you know, what Ronnie and, and Corey were just talking about. But you, you see great successes, like the president took over his Instagram account when he went to Alaska. Did anyone see that? Yeah. Okay, it was pretty incredible. It was also, I, I felt like I was watching my dad use Instagram. <laughs> it was perfect. Sometimes was, there's a finger in yeah, the Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, why did we love that? Why, why there was so much, uh, so much interest and why that, that worked so well and also had policy implications as well was because it had a degree of authenticity. Uh, it had a lot of authenticity. Um, that was him taking photographs and trying to celebrate this amazing natural environment that he's working hard to protect. Um, and so why I think that was successful was because of the investment that the White House, White House made and the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the internal uh, institutional infrastructure that you need to be able to pull something like that off. And that's a credit to Kari and her team. Um, and it was, it was amazing. Uh, so in terms of what you know, what Washington DC does really well is like at a moment like that, there's a, there are example after example from, you know, Speaker Ryan's office to, uh, I, I remember back, um, uh, I think uh, I, I loved when uh, Lita McCarthy was posting photographs of Beyonce. Like it was, there's a lot of, there's a lot of great personal investment in their Instagram accounts. Um, and I, I love seeing that and it's, it's definitely happening here in, in DC, but it's also happening around the world as well, increasingly. Yeah. I'm going to go to some questions from the audience. So here's one for you two. How much input and control does President Obama have over his social media? And I would add to that, does he actually enjoy it? Uh, I, I would say that uh, he absolutely does enjoy it. Um, to John's point, the president actually did take photos throughout Alaska and, you know, share them on Instagram. And similarly, uh, they were the first family was just in Carlsbad in Yosemite. And you can see it. The there are photos of the president out there holding up a phone, uh, snapping photos, because um, uh, not just does he enjoy it, I think he really sees the value in these platforms, not as um, add-ons, but really as an integral component of our strategy um, and, and messaging. And so, um, it, it is definitely, um, uh, it comes from the top at the White House for the work that we do. Frankly, we wouldn't be able to do it if uh, we didn't have the support and buy-in and interest from the President, the First Lady, and the Vice President to do the work that we do. Um, and uh, they are absolutely involved and hands-on in that work, and so it makes our jobs easy. They appreciate it, they're interested in it. Um, and uh, it, it uh, gives us the buy-in and the flexibility to experiment and to do new things, um, which uh, makes our jobs really interesting. I mean, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think it's interesting in that, um, you know, there, these are so many tools out there to, to reach people, and I think a lot of times you have, whether it's corporate brands or, or elected officials who feel like, uh, I need to get, uh, the first thing they do, they, they need to get all the social media handles and, um, and that's their strategy, just, just to start tweeting or just to start snapping or Instagramming. And that's sort of just the tip of the iceberg. A lot of the, the, the content that you put out needs to be compelling. You need to have a message. It needs to be a two-way conversation. It can't just be um, just broadcasting one, one direction, I think. Uh, I think that's why so many of these mediums are so compelling to all of us is that there is an interactivity there and, there is a, and each platform is distinct and so the content ought to be native to that platform. It's more than just putting the same image on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Snap. It's, uh, it's more thoughtful than that. I think what uh, the president has done is really set the precedent and the, and the bar for how elected officials need and should communicate with their constituents and, and young people in particular um, that, you know, the, the world will only get more engaged uh, via social media um, that I think they're sort of charting un, uncharted territory. They're really pioneering, you know, how government interacts with people um, 
in a ways that are unconventional. John, here's one for you. It strikes me that the future of social media is going to be people wanting to make a difference with those posts. You know, we do small gestures on our phones every day and we hope that collectively something will happen. I'm wondering whether you have advice for people who want to kind of turn their accounts or, or their work on social media into a kind of an activist effort. Yeah, I think, I think social context is incredibly powerful. Uh, it, see, seeing your friends do something, engaging in, in the political world in some way or in something that they care about, you know, will affect your opinion. Uh, I, th I think one of the most amazing things that I've seen on Instagram so far in this, in this cycle has been how many people are just taking selfies of themselves after they've voted. Uh, and that can serve as a reminder for people. Uh, that can also serve as a statement that they're, in, they're invested and that they're interested. Um, I've got to, you know, uh, I, I think in general, you know, millennials are not a monolithic group. There is a, you know, the, we come in all shapes and sizes and, um, and come, from, uh, come from everywhere. What, what I think is, is true though, is that we're, we, are, we are conscious and regardless of how much you, you use, you're using social media, you're in, engaging in the, in the media sphere, you're seeing all this conversation happen around the, the presidential election. So you have an, you have an opinion. Um, and I think, you know, especially when you see these pieces of content, like people just simply voting, uh, that, 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 is, that is a statement unto itself and very powerful. Ronnie, here's one for you, and actually whoever you are who put this in, this is one of my questions too. What is MTV doing to remain relevant, and how does that include the important lenses of intersectionality, feminism, et cetera? And I guess that question is, you know, for millennials, obviously everyone's aware of MTV, but we grew up uh, in an era where there were so many options for our, where we could click, where we could, you know, go to on our TVs. So how do you use MTV to continue to encourage those debates that we're involved in, sometimes on other platforms? Uh, great question. I, you know, I think it's, it's a challenge. As any content producer, creative uh, company, you have to be the best. I think, you know, uh, content is still king and it needs to be the best. And this is an audience uh, and a generation that's accustomed to some of the most amazing television and film and photography and uh, again, the bar is set very high. Um, you know, I think our strategy in, in getting in front of people is is the one that they've employed for, uh, you know, 34 years. Um, MTV's been around for 34 years. It's kind of crazy. Um, in that, you, we want to blend what it means to be a young person and not just be one or the other. It's, you know, being young is, is messy. It's fun. It's crazy. It's good. There's failures. There's wins. All that stuff, we embrace all of it. Um, whether it's, uh, and, and, and MTV's had a history of this for a long time, from the 80s talking about HIV AIDS when literally nobody was. You had a White House at the time who wouldn't even acknowledge that this was happening, but a media company was saying this is a crisis uh, and we need to do something about it. Uh, or in the 90s when uh, MTV was talking about sexual health where uh, still taboo to talk about, if, Teenagers, apparently teenagers are interested in sex, so huh. let's, let's give them the information to, to be able to, to be safe and, and, to, and, and to be educated on, on the risks. Um, in the 2000s, uh, the Darfur crisis, MTV, um, we did a, a, many specials on this, on this uh, the, the genocide in the region in a way that very few uh, media companies were. Um, and again, in a way where uh, I think it was Nick Kristof that had written in the New York Times basically complaining to President Bush that MTV is, is being a more of a leader on this issue than you are. Um, and then today, talking about, you know, in, in the time where we're living, unfortunately, with some explosive events re related to, to race um, that are so baffling that they're happening in the year 2015, 2016. Um, talking about race is hard, but we want to have the hard conversation. Um, we want to talk about campus sexual assault. We want to talk about why women make 79% of what men do every year. We want to talk about trans rights. We want to affirm these things in a way that's not patronizing. It's not, it's more than the more you know PSA spots. Um, no shade to our friends at NBC. <laughs> um, but these, comp these issues are so complicated and you can't start unless you initiate the conversation. And so um, 
we want to do it in an authentic way, and I think we want to do it uh, in a way that lives up to the tradition that MTV always has. Yeah. Corey, do you have advice for people who are struggling with um, negativity on social media? I imagine there's a lot that you see, probably to the point where you might be immune, but obviously I can speak for myself as a journalist, for many people who are in and out of the public sphere, or even just private people, they deal with a lot. And uh, it can make the whole process uh, a lot less fun and pretty discouraging. Yeah, um, that's a really good question, and uh, you know, we experience uh, we're constantly inundated with comments, um, many of which are negative, many of which, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of disrupt the kinds of work and the and the content that we're putting out there. But I would say is um, uh, what we value is that many times comments provide forums for people that don't necessarily agree, and that we are interested in um, uh, conversations happening. Um, you know, we don't just want to talk to our fans, um, but when it comes to, uh, you know, unproductive or uh, off-topic comments, as I'll call them, uh, you know, I, we, we can't spend that much time uh, uh, on those. I think um, what, what we do see many times, though, is, uh, you know, these really meaningful um, statements that are posted in the comment sections across a range of platforms, people saying things like, look, I'm a Republican, I don't agree with the president's policies, I didn't vote for him, but this issue is really important to me, um, so I just want to thank you for that. Um, and so, uh, you know, I don't think there's a perfect solution. I think that maybe this is one of the things that will continue to um, improve across platforms, uh, where comments will be structured in such a way um, uh, that it enables and encourages uh, disagreement and more meaningful conversations and less trolls. Um, but for the time being, uh, we do look at our comments and uh, you know, many times we'll share internally and with senior staff uh, and people across the building um, really meaningful and powerful comments um, that uh, are, are useful to us and that um, uh, uh, validate a lot of the work that we do. Yeah. John, do you have any thoughts about the problem of trolls, advice for people? Um, so there's, there's two things that I'll, I'll say here. The first is uh, this is something, uh, an issue that we care about deeply, absolutely. Um, you're able to report, uh, you know, violations uh, from within the ap application on Instagram, so it's really easy. We've tried to make that as simple as possible so that when people see, um, you know, bad content or bad behaviour, they're able to report that immediately. Um, the other thing is that you're also able to, you know, to block folks, and you're also able to, to choose to uh, to have a private account. And I think these are like these are, you know, simple tools that uh, almost immediately can can help you, you know, can help you address these kind of problems. Um, the second thing that I'd say uh, is that, you know, kind of complementary to that, is that uh, what I love about you know, this visual imagery that we are seeing, this acceleration of, 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 of visual content production is that there's, you know, there's a kind of truth to it. Um, you see people at these great civic moments, whether it's the, you know, the same-sex marriage referendum in, in Ireland, whether it's the, you know, the, um, uh, what happened in Baltimore last year, um, people are creating and people are engaging with that. And so they're actually contributing uh, an incredibly important visuals to, a, um, uh, to, to everyone. I want to mention something. I actually, there's a lot of high-minded conversation about discourse and conversation in the, in the comment section, but I have to say, has anyone seen a constructive conversation on a comment section? In my mind, it is like the sludge of <laughs> human reflex and instinct and, and uh, reactivity to things, and I, I don't know how helpful that actually is. I mean. You know, any tweet that the president puts out or Kim Kardashian puts out, for every, you know, great or that's awesome is the worst things you could possibly even <laughs> conjure. They are putting it out there. Uh, and, it, and it's discouraging, I say. And I only say that because I think it's discouraging. I think for a lot of reasons we need to, maybe there's another way to have this conversation or the, the tenor of our political discourse or the way that we communicate with each other that is not conducive to actually having meaningful conversations, um, and then it's 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 discouraging that uh, that that's so I think so intense in, in, in how we interact on social media. 
And I think one thing I would uh, add to that is we've sort of developed ways to offer opportunities for engagement um, many times that don't live in the comment section. Um, asking people to share content, share photos um, about the national parks that matter to them around the messaging of conservation and addressing climate change to protect uh, places like that for future generations. Or uh, we built a tool called We the People. It's a petitions platform that allows people to organize around the issues that they care about, that if they reach a certain threshold, guarantees an official response from the administration. Something that never existed. People always had a right to petition their government, but never a tool. And so um, I think for future White Houses, um, there will continue to be these questions and really um, a necessity to develop new tools and new ways uh, that don't rely necessarily on built-in comments uh, for uh, two-way interactions and for um, uh, giving people the opportunities to message the administration on the issues they care the most about. And um, we just have a little bit of time left, but I'd throw this out to the three of you. One concern with social media is as much as it connects us all, it can also allow uh, some dangerous ideas to take root and to spread very easily. Um, and I know as a journalist, one thing that we're coping with right now is uh, amid the rise of Trump, a very, very strong alt-right vein of anti-Semitism that we're seeing in our Twitter feeds a lot. Um, I'm wondering whether you guys think that censorship has a role to play here, um, how companies ought to handle that going into the future. Well, I'll start by saying, you know, I, I think you need to call these things out. Donald Trump has said racist things, but the words around what he says is racially tinged or racially charged, which is just a total cop-out in language. It's fucking racism, <laughs> some of the things that he said. <laughs> and. We need to use, we need to call it out. I think the media, uh, I mean, print, online, social, we need to combat that and call it out. That's not censorship, that's not being uh, slanted in your political point of view. Saying someone can't do a job because, they're ra because of their race is the definition of racism. You're not doing your job if you're not calling that out. I think that's a big part of what we all need to be doing more of. Um, and, and I'm and I disappointed that I haven't seen that enough. Um, what I would just say quickly is that I think there is a role for um, the media and the social platforms themselves to play in this. Um, I think it is uh, on all of us, not just the government, um, but the media, citizens, um, and, and platforms to um, uh, be active and to be uh, you know, aware and, and sensitive to um, you know, the, the needs of, of citizens. And I think that, um, you know, while, uh, you know, the question of, of censorship um, is a, a really tough one, uh, this is a new era. This is a problem that we've never had before. And uh, I think that it is going to take a lot of work and thoughtful consideration on the parts of all parties involved to figure out how to create better, safer communities online. Um, where people can voice all sorts of views. This isn't about uh, uh, you know, agreement or disagreement. This is about making sure the internet is a place where um, you know, people uh, uh, can feel safe. John, you want to close this out? Yeah, um, I think it's, you know, the, the way that I would put it is that uh, you know, we're, we're a platform. Uh, this is a space where everyone is free to create and everyone's free to consume. Uh, so, you know, what I love seeing is the fact that, rega you know, regardless of, of where, where they are on the political spectrum, they're using it. Regardless of, you know, where, where they come from, they, they're using it. And uh, that's, that's incredibly powerful. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, you'll see, you'll see more and more people using, using these platforms and, and becoming the centre of, of, of the place where they get their information. And, uh, you know, I think that's, that's going to, because it is such an even playing field, I think there's something really good about that. Great. Well, thank you all for being here. Let's give them a round of applause.